If you can't tell, we're a little confused with our newness, our something new. <laughs> we all are. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. <laughs> and we welcome each of you worshiping with us this morning here and online. So for first-time guests, if we have any guests, we're so glad you are here this morning. And we have a gift for you. If you'd like to <clears throat> receive a gift and you want to put your hand up, um, our usher will bring you something special. Or you can ask one of the ushers at the end of the service as well. Um, and please, also, if you are visiting with us today, fill out the yellow welcome card that's in the uh, front of the pew in front of you and put it in the offering plate or hand it to somebody as you head out the door. We look forward to getting to know you all. March mission of the month continues. Organized through the National Association of Congregational Christian Churches, the CCS Missions and Ministry Board has chosen to support one great hour of sharing for Syria and Turkey. This mission is a way for congregationalists around the world to join in prayer and give tangible support. Donate today. In your bulletin is a detailed write-up on the mission of the month. I'd like to hear more about that. History Sunday is next week, Sunday, March 26. Join us in celebrating 155 years with a special Sunday service and fellowship full of fun. You will have the opportunity to meet visitors from the past and make history together. 
We are still looking forward to our Easter and spring celebration. We have Lenten Bible study continuing tomorrow night, praying with the Psalms. That's on Zoom, and you can find that information in your bulletin. Lilies for Easter Sunday orders are due next week. If you would like an Easter lily placed in the sanctuary in memory or in honor of a loved one, please fill out the form in your bulletin with your contribution and place it in the offering plate or <clears throat> drop it off in the church office. Earth Day weekend coming up hand to hand in a new way. Sun Saturday, April 22nd, we will be working with Save Our Shores on a beach cleanup at Cowles Beach in Santa Cruz. Sign-ups are in Parish Hall today. And wait, there's more. On Sunday, the 23rd, we are hosting Whale Song by our own John Ryan, the Imbari, Imbari scientist. It's a great one. You don't want to miss this. And, and I've heard he's updated it. So check your bulletin, the weekly e-news on our website, and mark your calendar with detailed information on March and April upcoming events. Join me responsively in our call to worship this morning. Happy are those whose way is blameless. Who walk in the law of the Lord. Stand, would you please, and sing together hymn number 594, Like a River Glorious.
May we pray. O God of all creation, give us tender hearts today that we might feel as you feel. Give us ears to hear. Give us ears to hear that we might respond to your call. We pray also for eyes to see that we may follow your path. And when we meet others, express your love with words of comfort and support. By your grace, bless us, O oh God, in our worship with understanding to know you and the wisdom to walk in your ways. Amen. Morning, everybody. Our responsive reading is from the book of Luke, chapter 12, verses 22 through 34. You may find the selection in your bulletin. He said to his disciples, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. Of how much more value are you than the birds? If then you are not able to do small a thing as that, why do you worry about the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, you of little faith? For it is the nations of the world that strive after all these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Do not be afraid, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possession, give your alms, make purses for yourselves that do not wear out, he said to his disciples. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. For where, for where your treasure is, May God add his blessing to the reading of his word.
Thank you so much, choir, for that Celtic blessing put to music, especially on the heels of St. Patrick's Day. Uh, very appropriate. I was thinking of my two granddaughters, my oldest born on St. Patrick's Day, and then her cousin, I guess my second oldest granddaughter, my other granddaughter, born the next day. Not the same year, but... Uh, Coupled together like that, and uh, what a wonderful blessing uh, to be reminded of as we think of those that we love, uh, friends and family and others. We pause now for a time of morning prayer, and I invite you to join me uh, as we pray. O oh God of, of heaven and earth, let your power for good be known through those who have your spirit. Among those of us who call ourselves the church, among those of us who call ourselves this church, Congregational Church of Soquel, let your light break in on human blindness, O oh God, and and your calling, may it be heard even amid our fears. May those whose lives are broken by pain or disappointment or by illness, by limitations, by sorrow, by lack of opportunity or lack of recognition, may they experience inward healing, O oh God, of that peace that we find in the soul, that peace which is a treasure of the heart, which we hope to learn of more today, which is the love, ultimately, of Jesus that can bring us, even in the midst of this uncertain world, into your presence at every moment. Oh God, as you bring your kingdom ever closer 
to us. So may we help bring it to pass in all the world. Through Jesus Christ, in whose name we ask, and by his prayer, we offer now with one voice saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Sharing now uh, the work and financial support of our beloved church, we ask that our ushers will prepare themselves to please come and to receive now our morning offering. stand for our doxology. Creator, for these valuable gifts and for the faith by which they are brought today, we give you thanks in the name of Jesus. Amen. You know, somebody has said, don't be afraid to ask dumb questions. They're easier to accept than dumb answers. (laughs) And I think there's some wisdom there. So having said that, here's here's the question. How much do we really know about God? Now, for those who grew up in religious households or, say, a church, maybe like the one that we're sitting in right now, you may have come to know God 
who was introduced to you in a variety of ways and frequently with the quantifier all appearing right up front, the kind of sacred adverb that is that one might hope to see connect all the, you know, theological dots or at least, you know, that's the idea. Like for, like for an instance, God is all-knowing, all-present, all-powerful, all-wise, and as a familiar hymn puts it that we sometimes sing, in light inaccessible hid from our eyes. Most blessed, most glorious, the ancient of days, almighty, victorious, thy great name we praise. You know what? I've heard that hymn all my life, and I've always found the lyrics somewhat confounding. Maybe you have too. Beautiful, yes, but kind of a doctrinal data dump. It's hard to take all that stuff in. Sure, it's filled with plenty of information about God who possesses, well, you know, all those qualities it describes and more. Yet still, a God who is inaccessible? And what is more, a God who is hid from our eyes? Seems like a disconnect. But listen, you know, I get it. The mystery of God makes for a majestic hymn. Am I right? And certainly there is much about God that reaches beyond our human imagining and greater still, our knowledge. Yes, God occupies a large share of mystery, no question. And it's true, we cannot, quote, see God with our eyes. But nonetheless, just you know, sometimes we long for a God not inaccessible, but accessible. Not one most glorious, aloft in the ancient days, as it were, but a God close to the earth and most present in our time and in our place. In short, I guess, we seek after a God not you know, hid from our eyes, but rather one that is at least by virtue of character perceived, apparent, as it were, in plain sight of what you might call our emotional vision. Well, today, we conclude a life and worship series I've been calling Outside the Box. From the Gospel of Luke, we've been exploring examples of Jesus' teaching that take us really sometimes beyond established patterns of thought, outside the box, you might say, of our you know, conventional wisdom. Namely, New ways of imagining our faith in God are presented here by Jesus. Both its meaning and purpose, yes, but also in virtue of its application and its practice. So in respect to my original question, you know, dumb or not, how much do we really know about God? Well, our scripture today from Luke's Gospel, chapter 12, introduces God to us in a refreshingly new manner, I think. What we learn is something truly kind of outside the box. And it's not a God packed tightly inside impersonal abstractions, sometimes you know, found in hymns and statements of faith. No. But rather, it is discovered instead in the freedom of a rich emotional experience, what Jesus calls here God's good pleasure. Sometimes you know, something made accessible by way of the natural world appears in Jesus' teaching here. The earth that is round about us, beneath our feet, does the teaching. Here Jesus both describes and embodies not 
Not a God dressed up in a pricey wardrobe of like inaccessible miseries. Okay, maybe there's a time for that. But, but here, it's a loving creator clothed in the emotional garments of what it describes as God's good pleasure. Yes, there is a mysterious side to God, but, but paradoxically, there is also a side within reach, one we, we long for, that we hope to welcome, one that is approachable. As such, God longs. You know, indeed, God receives pleasure to give us what Jesus pictures in our scripture as a kingdom, he says, one to inhabit. You know, a place and a way of life, so to speak, that he compares to an unfailing treasure. Strive for his kingdom, we are told. There your treasure is, and there your heart will be also. It is this God that we find to be within reach of our hearts. What is more, the good pleasure of God invites us to turn over our fears in exchange for a deeper, a more durable, a more lasting faith. Jesus offers an explanation of this particular variety of faith by turning first to the matter of our human condition. He doesn't avoid it. He doesn't deny it. He doesn't try to cover it up with empty promises. He talks about it. its fears, its anxieties, for they often produce within us and among us that posture, you might say, which makes us turn away from God to other things. We turn away because of fear. But then, Jesus immediately offers a remedy by way of a story. A story of all things about birds. You know, followed then by what you might call a gift of flowers. Now, I don't recall anywhere in the Bible where Jesus is pictured as like a martial artist master. Have you? Uh, but here he does something like a jujitsu move worthy of the title master, at least from the standpoint of spiritual wisdom. And although... You know, I can picture a meme parody like appearing in your heads here. Stay with me, if you will, okay? In effect, by teaching outside the box, Jesus does something akin to a martial arts maneuver, transforming the energy that might otherwise embolden the fears that threaten us, and instead redirecting that energy as he does in the service of faith. The kind of faith that can and will empower us, making us whole and free from the kind of anxiety that plagues our lives, that plagues our world. As I mentioned, Jesus clarifies his outside the box description of faith with an illustration about birds and in particular, ravens. Consider the ravens, he says. They neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn. And yet, it says, God feeds them. Imagine ravens. Why didn't he choose like a sweet bluebird or something? I mean, come on, ravens? When ravens get in a group, you know what they're called? They're not called a flock. They're called a murder. Maybe we need to give ravens a second chance, and Jesus does it here by taking this whole explanation a little bit out 
of the box. Now, reference here to storehouse and barns are, of course, Jesus' metaphors for human behavior, the kind that often overestimates the value of material possessions stored up, you know, replacing faith in God with fear and the gift of peace for material things, sometimes a desire for control, often a, a misplaced security that soon gives way to inner turmoil and just, well, more anxiety. So, apparently Jesus was not only a martial arts master, he was something of an ornithologist as well, okay? Or at least, he was an avid bird watcher, that seems clear. Seriously, though, Jesus did keep a sharp eye on the natural world, and it's not surprising that the raven captured his attention. According to experts, ravens are considered to be among the most intelligent birds on the planet. In a book I read several years ago, which I would recommend if you're interested in birds, is entitled The Bird Way, A New Look at How Birds Talk, Work, Play, Parent, and Think by author Jennifer Ackerman, who's a journalist who specializes in projects surrounding science. She writes that complex behavior occurs in birds that have a brain big for their body size. Ravens, she adds, have among the largest relative brain size of any bird. They also enjoy a long juvenile period, she says, when youngsters hang around with their parents, maybe longer than other birds do. This permits them to learn how to be efficient, creating a habit of exploiting all available food resources. Ravens specialize in being food generalists. And yes, that includes being scavengers, too. Most surprising, though, raven's behavior also spills over into something scientists are beginning to call, even in the animal world and among birds, emotional cognition. For example, the author says when a raven sees allies, you know, other birds struggling with a task that denies them food, its own interest in food diminishes some. This kind of emotional cognition, whether positive or negative, it is considered a building block for empathy. So, so much for the so-called idiom bird brains, right? To the contrary, ravens are smart, perhaps smart enough to trade their fears for something that appears, well, more like faith. And Jesus seemed to think so. In his estimation, they did not respond to fear by building elaborate barns, nor did they store away excess food. Instead, they first and foremost put their trust in the environment into which they are placed, the skills they learned from one another, and even the empathy, perhaps, they seem to share amid the challenges they face together. In short, the raven shapes its life not around trepidation, but trust, not amid fears, but rather a kind of faith in relationship to our Creator, should we do anything less? Jesus does not discourage the act of planning or preparation or even, you know, applying those things to material possessions. That's really not the point. However, in respect to priorities, what is most important in Jesus' estimation, the discussion changes. He asks us to do something entirely different than common sense sometimes, something that possessions cannot accomplish, something that control cannot achieve. When he tells us to place our faith above our fears. He leads us to a place within the heart reserved not for grasping but giving, not for possessions but a sense of purpose, not merely a desire to be, but to become. Namely, my friends, 
the heart that makes ample room for faith, the place where God can move in and among and through our plans, shaping them, moving them, and finding therein a life that is at peace. Because that is where we discover the kingdom that he promises us, the treasure he speaks about, the blessing he calls God's good pleasure. So, is it any wonder Jesus concluded his lesson about the birds this way? For life is more than food. Consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn, and yet God feeds them. How much more value are you than the birds? In addition to a story about the ravens, Jesus kind of leaves us in a nice way with what you might call the gift of flowers. So here, in addition to being a martial artist and an ornithologist, Jesus is also a skilled florist, apparently. In our scripture from Luke, Luke's gospel, Jesus speaks about lilies and then proceeds to make an arrangement kind of, that appears a lot like a vase filled with the kind of faith that he's explaining. Here, lilies are mentioned, but, you know, if you send, I don't know, this word through the pipeline of language translation in biblical history, lilies are understood to be a general reference for flowers, really, all flowers. Okay, most of us have our favorites, right? What are some of your favorites, by the way, when it comes to flowers? Yes. Peonies. What? Peonies. Oh, beautiful. You know, I'm not even familiar with what those look like. What do they look like? Like a really beautiful rose. I guess that's better. Mm -hmm. Challenging. That's lovely. Other favorite flowers? What are the alternate? Yeah, a bird of paradise, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, my mother loved those. We had those in front of our home. I noticed those today. Yeah. Yes, Julie. Lilacs. Huh? Lilacs. Oh, lilacs. Okay. Yeah. So yes. Daffodils. <laughs> okay. We got like over. Oh, right. We have a daffodil tree, probably. Uh, a couple more. Daisy. Yes. Daisy. Okay. Yeah. They just they're so accessible, huh? Yes. Calla lilies. Calla lilies. Okay. Roses. Sunflowers. What? Sunflowers. Yeah, I love I, I bring those home sometimes. They really make a statement, don't they? Incredible. Kid, we both think roses. Roses, okay. We have a rose garden uh, here. We're surrounded, uh, really, with flowers. Regardless of your choice, though, the symbolic beauty and the power of flowers, they touch us all, don't they? You know, given or received, they are literally a gift of life. One that appears out from under the earth itself. Call them evidence of God's good pleasure springing forth from the natural world. And no matter if you are giving or receiving them and the charm they bring, the gift of flowers are a sign, I think, of God's blessing, a suggestive symbol of the kingdom. Jesus seeks to reveal within our hearts. They are, in short, emblems of God's good pleasure. And when we bring them into our lives or into our home, and we found out what kind of flowers you like in your homes. I know in mine, it's uh, usually irises or tulips. But whatever, whatever we have, maybe we have an opportunity to think of them in different ways. It's the presence of God's good favor received in faith. For this reason, Jesus presents flowers as an example of faith, much like he presented the ravens as representatives of faith. Faith worthy of following, the kind that places the priority of God's pleasure over 
possessions, a faith that directs our time, our energy, our purpose, not in the act of controlling or striving or grasping or spinning or toiling, as it says in our scripture, but rather with peace, the peace we receive from compassion and service and giving and gathering. Moreover, this shapes the way we appear to ourselves and one another. Flowers really, to a large extent, are all about appearance, aren't they? And in, although perhaps we emphasize that particular subject too much in our society, we do ask ourselves, how do we appear to others? Not so much physically or in our appearance or if we're attractive physically, but by way of our hearts, our character, things we do and say, the integrity that we hope we bring. Well, here, God promises to clothe us as if we were flowers. To make that statement, why do you worry about the rest? Jesus says, consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon, great King Solomon of the Hebrew Scriptures, in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. If God so clothes the grass of the field, how much more will he clothe you? And so, my friends, may the ravens teach us. May the flowers clothe us. May the good pleasure of God be made known among us all. Amen.